Hi, welcome to another edition of Horner's Corner. I'm your host, Ray Horner. Of course, mornings, 93.5-1590 WAKR. And you can always watch our morning show now on WAOH.TV as well. Today, we're going to sit down and talk with Joey Arietta, who has been a force in the Akron area in many ways. Her determination on the softball diamond led her to many accomplishments on the diamond, off the diamond, and running a diamond team. And she's a good friend of mine. I don't know if everyone knows everything that Joey has helped out this Akron community in. And in my opinion, she is one of Akron's greats. So Joey, welcome to the show with Horner's Corner. Appreciate you making time for us. Oh, thank you, Ray. I love you know, being with you and talking to you about you know, what we've been doing here. And, in Acker for the last number, it's quite a few number of years now. It sure is. Well, let's go back to how you ended up in the Akron area because you were born and raised in Cuyahoga County and you ended up coming down to the University of Akron and getting involved with our community there. But talk about making your way from Mayfield down to the University of Akron. Well, it was kind of being a little selfish, you know, I come from an Italian family, so I didn't want to be too far away from Sunday dinners at my mom's house. I can so, relate. So Akron, uh, you know, was really, uh, uh, that was one of the reasons that I, I came here, so that I could really commute back and forth uh, and stay in touch with my family back at home. And then you got your education at the University of Akron. Talk about those days. Those days were wonderful. You know, I got involved in a lot of the activities that were going on on campus. Um, got my degree in communications and speech, uh, with an emphasis obviously in radio and television, believe it or not. And then I stuck, hung around. I uh, went back to Cleveland, uh, back to Mayfield House for just a short period of time. Wanted to get my master's degree. And so I came back to Akron and I got my master's degree in co college adult counseling. And uh, luckily before I ended up finishing that degree, I uh, got a job at the University of Akron in their academic advising uh, services and uh, remained there for quite some time, uh, you know, counseling students. So Joey Arietta is with us on Horner's Corner. So Joey, let's now take it to the next level. How did you get involved in women's softball because a lot of this is going to have to do with women's softball, the racers, Firestone Stadium and such. So talk about the connection there. University of Akron takes you to softball. That's kind of a crazy story because I was <laughs> doing um, my counseling and I had a pretty uh, several hundred kids that I used to uh, counsel at the university, including the athletic teams, the players that were on the athletic teams at that time. But my boss who knew I you know, loved playing softball and had done it in the summertime, he came down to my office and said uh, uh, that uh, Gordon Larson, who was the athletic director at that time, uh, would like to see me because the softball coach, we were playing slow pitch at that time, it was just a, you know, kind of a varsity sport playing slow pitch, and that the young lady had uh, just gotten a, a full-time job and they needed somebody basically to pinch hit for a little bit. And so I was kind of the likely one because Dudley, my, my uh, uh, boss, knew very well that Gordon needed somebody to step in in two weeks uh, to take over the team. So I agreed to do that and only thought I was going to be doing that for that season. Well, we ended up winning the state uh, tournament uh, that year and uh, so Gordon said to me, uh, how, how about just staying around? So I did, that was in 1978-79. And then when they decided that we won the state title again, uh, he says, well, you know, I think maybe you ought to hang around and do this again. I said, no. <laughs> I said, I have a full academic uh, counseling, you know, I can't do that and everything. And I said, the only reason I would stay is if you allowed me to create and, uh, the program and bump it from slow pitch a fast pitch and he said well if you can get all of the things arranged because right then we were not in the NCAA we were playing AIAW it was intercollegiate athletics for women mm -hmm. so it was a whole different you know kind of setup back then and uh, and of course as we were trying to get into um, the this, uh, the fast pitch arena the University of Akron was moving to the Ohio Valley Conference well the Ohio Valley Conference did not offer uh, fast pitch softball for women. So I approached Gordon again. I said, look, you know, we're going nowhere there. 
Okay, so can I petition to stay at Division II and um, you know, really develop the program as an independent team? He said, well, let's you know, give it a whirl. You know, otherwise, okay. you know, we're gonna, the program's gonna kind of be shut down. We ended up being able to do that to convert the program and get into uh, Division II as an independent, which was a crazy thing, because you know, once you're an independent, uh, you're in a position where in order to go to a national championship, you gotta literally win every game. Right. And so we did start doing that in 1980. And we ended up in 1983, finishing 13th in the country. And uh, then things started to go really, really well with uh, recruiting. I think the, one, of, one of the things I'm most proud about is that we created this program with kids that were born and raised in Summit County and a couple in Cuyahoga County. But predominantly, I would say a good 95% of our team came from the, the um, high schools right here in Akron. Back then, Akron was really becoming a really tremendous um, hotbed for the game. So we kind of hit it at the right time. But when we joined uh, the um, in the Division II area, and, uh, there were only six teams in the state of Ohio playing fast pitch softball. Mm. So um, it was kind of a new thing. So you had to kind of you know get around and play all of those, and it didn't matter what division they were in. You know, they played the game, you had to go. So we ended up playing Ohio State several times during that time. We were very fortunate that we came out on the winning side of things back then. But in '83 and, and '80, uh, beginning, to, uh, I could see the program was really you know, starting to move forward with our kids. We're being really, really committed to learning the game. We, um, we would do chalk talk where the kids would go in the classroom and we'd teach them all the, uh, the plays and everything on the chalkboard. And that, I think, helped them kind of internalize in their mind and everything just how to play the game. Mm -hmm. So as, as 1983 rolled around, I could tell things were kind of turning in a great direction. If you don't mind, can I jump in here? Because I want to go back to the, to the beginning here. So you're, you take over a program and you're in academics. So I want to go back to your knowledge of softball when you get into the sport coaching at the University of Akron, because obviously you knew the game. You won a state title or a, a, a title in your very first year and in the second year, and you take it to another level going on. What was your knowledge of softball before you took over the program? You mean as, as a At as the a university? Play? Well, you know, um, I never got to play, you know, uh, collegiately, you know, even in high school, because, you know, that, you know, I was kind of, uh, nothing had happened for women in sports back right, in that. Yeah. And, you know, quite honestly, uh, at that time when, uh, uh, sports was developing for women. Athletic departments at the collegiate level were kind of tolerating women's sports because they really didn't have the money, you know, to do it, which I understood. They really um, didn't have, um, you know, the administrative structure and everything to develop a women's program. So knowing the game really, really helped me navigate, you know, all of those sure. out at obstacles back then and there because there were were quite a few, but. You know, I had learned how to play uh, growing up with my brother. Okay. You know, I was I was his I was his quarterback when he had to learn how to be a halfback. You know, <laughs> um, you know when he was a pitcher on the a baseball team, I had to you know be you know his catcher. So I grew up learning how to play with the boys. Yeah. And, and then she and we're talking with Joey Arietta this month on on Horner's Corner. So as you can see, Joey takes this program, now starts to build it to national prominence, and you're starting to have to recruit. And like you said at the beginning of this, this is mostly Summit County players. Mm -hmm. So then, and this will serve you well as we get on into this story with the racers and such. But so now you're going out with this program and you're bringing kids in to an Akron program that's playing an independent and it's Division Two. How difficult was that? And then talk about the next transition. You know, it was very difficult because you know at that time, you know, the, the as I think a lot, a little different right now, but the really, really outstanding teams were in California or in the south, you know, Southwest, mm -hmm. and so we had to really travel a lot uh, to be able to meet the competition. Um, but 
what I did in, uh, in our scheduling, which I think really, really helped us. I scheduled Division I teams uh, because I figured if we were going to go anywhere, we would have to elevate our game to be able to play with those California teams and those Texas and Arizona teams. So moving us up and playing a predominantly Division I schedule, even though we were Division II, helped our program get to the point where we could compete at the national level in 83, 84 and 85. The exposure alone, right? Yeah, the exposure and uh, you know, really uh, challenging our players to play at a, at a higher level. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I always told them, you know, we can do whatever we want within our heart and in our mind. We just got to put out the effort. And we did. And we learned from the Division I teams, you know, how to play the game at their level so that when we moved on into the Division II ranks uh, nationwide, we would be in a much, much better position. So then Joey Arrieta takes that thought process from the University of Akron and will transition into the Akron Racers. So talk about that transition for you going to the racers. She ends up being owner, GM of the racers. Oh, by the way, she also did field duty, duties. She would rake the infield, she would mow the grass, and she would set up tournament after tournament at Firestone Stadium, spreading the game of softball and also bringing economic wealth into the greater Akron area as well. We'll get to the charitable aspect, which she has spearheaded for many years as well. But let's talk about that transition. So now you're eventually gonna go from the University of Akron to the Akron Racers. So talk about that. Well, that, the, again, that was, a, that was a crazy kind of transition too, <laughs> because you know I was working at the university uh, you know, full time. Yeah. And uh, I had been approached, really, Don Pasquale, you know, said, you know, was, uh, Without him, that would never have happened, to be honest with you, because he, uh, he understood the value of us you know, creating a program here. Uh, we had the facility. Uh, the, the, the racers, I, you know, I was kind of uh, talking to the folks who were setting up the teams in other parts of the country. And I went to a meeting, I was invited to a meeting because I kept saying you need to bring a team to Akron, you need to bring a team to Akron. And we, we were getting some interest but I went to this meeting where all the other team owners were, and they came up and they were going to do an all-star game. And nobody in the room volunteered to do the all-star game. And I said, well, we'll do it in Akron. You know, that brought them all to Akron. Nice. We had, I think, over 3,900 people that showed up for the all-star game. And at that point, they said, well, we kind of think that Akron can support a team. And we were awarded a team right thereafter. Um, and then from that point on, um, I really didn't, uh, I was just spirating the whole thing, didn't know that I was going to take over as yeah. owner and GM, but I'm in the, um, the luncheon that they're talking about bringing a team to Akron, and they're announcing, uh, the president of the league is announcing that Joey's going to, you know, take over, be the GM and the owner <laughs> thing, and I'm like sitting there going, oh my goodness, give me the phone because I better call my boss, Jesse Marquette at the University of Acker and tell him I'm not quitting, okay? I, this is something that's really new to me, but um, we'll talk about it after I figure out with them what the, what's going on. So that's kind of how I, I fell into <laughs> it. Um, and, but here again, then the knowledge of, of softball kind of takes over. Um, I knew a lot of players that played not just in this area, but in the surrounding universities. So I was very well, you know, uh, informed about uh, the talent that was out there at the collegiate level. I also built the first few years of the racers with ladies and players that were born and raised here in Akron. Mm -hmm. Carla Brookbank, you know, uh, went and grabbed her from the, the Virginia Roadster team. Amy Kyler, who is the Cleveland State um, coach right now, grabbed her from the uh, Carolina Diamonds. So I brought back the players that were, had gone and played in the league. I brought them back to Akron to start the Akron Racers team. So that's how kind of we, we all kind of try to put the whole thing together. So we go into the late 90s and, and now you've got the racers going. Um, we build up a conference or I should say a league 
is the better term with women's softball. So talk about those days because softball is part of it, but with you being quote owner GM, there's a lot more to it. And that's branding and marketing the team and letting the city of Akron know we've got a professional softball team here. Come and see us at this wonderful facility called Firestone Stadium that is still used today in higher ranks for softball. So talk about those stages of selling this team to the greater Akron area. Well, I think, you know, selling a team starts with, you know, the, you know who, are, who are the individuals that you're bringing here that are going to perk some attention that someone's going to want to come and see. Right. And certainly the, the hometown uh, ladies and players that we, you know, retained in the, in the, in the, um, the first couple of years of our roster, it certainly helped us. I think but we had to go out and we had to educate, uh, you know, the community about the value of having a professional team. Uh, in Because what it was kind of a, a as Don uh, Pasqualic, when he uh, said, hey, we need to bring this team here, um, it was an economic development kind of concept because what he wanted with the, with the um, the tournaments that I was doing and the racers and everything was to bring people to Akron. Bring people to Akron so that you know they can experience Akron, experience, go to our, our, um, our restaurants, you know, our, our just all of our yep. uh, places that of interest here. So it was kind of how to, how to use that as a catalyst for bringing people into Akron. And, and that was kind of a lot my mantra. I would go out and talk about, you know, what what this draw of having a professional team in a, um, a community can do for the community at large. And you know, that's all obvious that we did the, the tournaments, we went to special events, we uh, did the um, Division II National Championships we brought here. Um, you know, brought a lot of events to Akron that brought people to the city so that you could see and live and work and you know, really, many kids who ended up staying here uh, and, and never left Akron. We're talking with Joey Arietta this month on Horner's Corner. And when you look at the racers, Joey, you were smart enough to realize that in order to get the Akron community to look at the racers, you had to be part of the community. And that's where I wanted to get to the aspect of, with you um, being so dedicated to the Akron area with not only the team, the players, and your methodology, breast cancer awareness, passing the hats during the every game, reaching out and donating so much dollars to the Racers Foundation, understanding that this is a community the Racers and you are calling home. You can't expect them to come to the gates if you're not part of their community. And talk a little bit about that thought process from you. You know, I think probably if I, you know, as I, you know, kind of look back at all the years and the things that I've done, we won a lot of games, we did a lot of <clears throat> great things on, on the diamond and everything, but probably uh, my greatest joy has been, um, you know, what, we, what we've done on the philanthropy side. You know, the breast cancer, you know, the, um, when George Lagos called me actually 25 years ago and oh. said, hey, you know, I want to have this luncheon and I need you to help me uh, put this all together and we're going to raise money for breast cancer so that we can have mammograms for individuals who can't afford them in our community. I said, okay, let's, let's give it a whirl. Okay, so we did 25 years ago um, and now this year we'll be celebrating that 25th anniversary. Um, my, what, what we did with the racers, uh, uh, and now it's called, it's named after me, the foundation, but we raised money for the mammogram program, started doing that 25 years ago. Uh, probably have raised over $350,000 uh, for the mammogram program, uh, which I'm, I'm incredibly proud. But the way it started was I ran around Firestone Stadium with pink buckets, yep. and I asked people to give me a dollar, and that's really how it started. And then the racers, they uh, we always used to have pink jerseys and we auctioned those pink jerseys off, and that was another way that we raised money that went into the, the pot for the mammogram program. So I think what's really important is that I wanted to teach our players that this part of you is important. If you're gonna be in a community, you, know, you need to provide some sort of give back. You know, what can you do to help the community that you live in? 
playing ball is one thing, you're entertaining them, and that's a great thing, but what else are you gonna do with your life going forward? And oddly enough, many of my players to this day still carry the paint bucket kind of concept into things that they're doing or other um, um, you know, issues and, and concerns and things that they have in their community. So that was really important to me to you know, kind of embellish that part of who we were so that the kids could take that and they could take it beyond the diamond and into their community, which they have done. And the foundation has continued even without the racers. They have. Um, I found ways over the years to keep it going. Um, you know, um, every year I've been able to um, match the year. So this year, this October, we'll present the check for $25,000. Huh. Um, I'm a huge supporter of um, Stewart's Caring Place that I work at right now, part-time part doing uh, community outreach. I also have raised money for the, you know, cancer in general now. Having worked at Stewart's, that's, you know, there's a um, multitude of cancers that we support in the, the effort for individuals to get through that cancer journey and get on the other side of all of the treatment and medical things, you know. If you don't mind, there was there, so many avenues that you could have gone down and, and helping the community, but you've centered in on the medical side, you've centered in on the fight in cancer. Do you mind? sharing why that's so important to you? Well, you know, it kind of started, you know, when I was a kid, I was 16 years old, and they thought I had cancer. And I remember um, what <clears throat> my family went through, my sister and my brother, uh, how devastated everybody was. And back then, it took them a long time to figure out, you know, if you really had cancer. They didn't have all the tools and the medical devices that they, they do today. Um, so. That, you know, kind of always has been in the back of my mind, okay, that, you know, what my family experienced, it wasn't much what I experienced, more what I saw there. And so when I had an opportunity to look into um, the whole breast cancer mammogram kind of concept, because when we first started doing it um, 25 years ago, um, it took you about two weeks to get the results uh, from, you know, the mammograms. And over the years, you know, now, today, by the time you get in your car and are headed home, you have an answer. So we've come a long way, okay? There's different types of, of uh, mammograms that are given, 3D ones now today. But it's really, really important that this affected families. And I think that's kind of what hit home going back to when I was growing up and what happened in, in my own experience, how it affected families. And breast cancer does a huge, it, it's like a bomb going off in your head with your family trying to hold all the pieces together. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that I went in that direction because of that experience I had when I was 16 years old. And this community, you heard her mention, over $350,000 through this foundation and the hard work by Joey and her teams have raised through the years. I want to go back to Firestone Stadium because you're, you're with the racers. You have an old facility with a lot of history. You and your team work tirelessly in renovating, fixing up, and making that stadium what it is. And I bring that up because today so many families are going there with the popularity of fast pit softball and seeing Firestone Stadium where it is now with the field turf and everything. But really hard work started by you and your field team that wasn't large and they put in a lot of hours, sometimes 18, 19 hours in a day. They'd work till midnight, get up at 6 a.m. and start dragging the field again. But anyways, you guys saw Firestone Stadium as a gem. We all now see it what it is, but your vision for Firestone Stadium is still with us today. You know, I, I can honestly say um, I love Firestone Stadium. You know, I, I How love can you the, not? I love the old the old feel that it has to it, um, and I'm kind of a traditionalist. I like the dirt and the grass. Um, yes, we had to work very very hard. Uh, I had a great group of guys and gals that um, helped me, you know, put that field together every day, and it was it was a difficult. Uh, thing to do uh, given Mother Nature and the way things are in terms of our weather here. 
um, it's very difficult to turn the, turn the field over. The, the situation that they have now with the turf, you know, I think if it were it rained in an hour, you can be back on the field again. Uh, that was not really the case when we were doing it. But there was this determination in, in my mind, whether it didn't matter who was on the field, it was an, a 10-year-old or it was one of my professional players. I wanted to make sure that, they had, that everyone had a professional experience. And it starts with the field. It starts with the manicuring of that field, the lining of that field, that's what really is the game. The game is on the field. And, and the experience that we wanted to everyone to have was this is, you know, we're gonna put, we're gonna put the scoreboard up, we're gonna put sound, you know, we're gonna call your name out. We're gonna do all those things that we do with the professional team, but we're gonna do it for a 10 year old too. And that was a commitment um, that our staff, both in the concession area, Kathy Hale, who was phenomenal in running our concession program, to Stacey Corp, who did all our ticketing and everything. But we had a very, very small staff, mm -hmm. very, very small staff. So we all had to do a lot of things. When the field needed done, everybody put their boots on and grabbed the rake, um, no matter what you were doing. The ultimate compliment, right, being so many years ago when the OHS AA comes in, sees what Akron has at Firestone Stadium and says, hey, we're going to move the, national, the state championships right here to Firestone and they've stayed ever since. You know, I think the fact that, you know, a lot of folks, I think, question the money put in the Firestone Stadium back then to bring the professional team here. But it certainly was the catalyst for bringing the state high school tournament here because had none of those, uh, you know, amenities that were added to Firestone Stadium when the races, uh, you know, came to town. It just would not have happened because we wouldn't have had, we, we needed a scoreboard, we needed the sound system, we needed all those things that make a, a facility, um, you know, more of a venue. And we, and, and I think it's 2008, uh, when the uh, state brought the state high school tournaments uh, here, um, that, that was, kind of very rewarding. It was very rewarding that they were able to see the value of this f phenomenal historical facility. And, and Joey, we would be remiss if we didn't mention probably the pinnacle of your career here is probably calling games with me on the radio. Just kidding, but we've even had a chance to, I know we did a Chinese game against uh, um, uh, the racers, I believe, and then we've also done some high school uh, softball games with tournaments in the OHSAA. So not only are you dragging the field and mowing the field, you're also owning a team, general manager of a team, and you're broadcasting softball. Yeah, <sighs> you, you know, um, yeah, that, that's exhausting to even really think about it. And, you know, um, sure would have liked to have had some other individuals to take over some of those roles because it, it was really, you know, 24 seven for me. You were. Um, but you know, I wouldn't trade those days for anything. You know, um, the the my you know kind of greatest accomplishments of, uh, besides you know the, my philanthropic work is who all those young ladies are today. You know, uh, the scholarships that my women had in in high school uh, and then going into the college ranks. Uh, you know, were nurses, they're doctors, they're business women. My players today. Uh, from the racers are now head coaches at some of the major universities in the country. So my job overall to move those young women from where they were when I got them to where they are today is probably, uh, you know, the, the greatest joy. There are many winners in the greater Akron area when you think about them and you've heard the story of Joey and the game and she always wanted to make it seem as utmost it is for all of the people that played at Firestone Stadium from the racers to the teams coming in and I think we're all winners with Joey in our community and you can hear just during this interview how probably at some point Joey's work has touched you in one way or another whether that be through raising dollars to fight cancer, maybe a niece, maybe a daughter, someone in your family has played softball at Firestone Stadium, or certainly come in contact with Joey through the University of Akron as well. She certainly is one of Akron's greats. Thanks for joining us this month on Horner's Corner. I appreciate it and I appreciate our friendship.
Thank Joey Ariad has been with us on Horner's Corner. I'm Ray Horner. Thanks for taking in the show this month.